to a very special edition of Fire by Night. It's entitled Satanism Unmasked. My name is Blaine Bartell, and I want you to know the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse number 11 says that we are to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to expose them. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this program. Guess who our special guest is? Mike Warnke. He's an ex-hippie, ex-drug addict, and formerly a Satanist high priest, now one of America's favorite Christian comedians. You're really going to like him. You know, thousands of teenagers across North America are directly involved in Satanism. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. And their involvement is being accompanied by hideous, perverse acts, things like murder, suicide, the ritualistic slaughter of animals and children. We see it in our newspapers. We watch it on our nightly news programs. You can see the, the graffiti in your own city uh, and in your own streets. And yet the church, the, the large majority of the body of Christ, has ignored this, and, and, and they're not doing anything about it. But I want you to know, Jesus never ignored the devil. He confronted him head on, and he won. The Bible says that the church will prevail against the gates of hell. That means we're going to invade satanic territory and take it over for Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to do in the next few minutes. We're going to walk right into Satan's territory, expose him, and show this generation that they can be victorious over their enemy through Jesus Christ. And this is Beat Around the Bush, the tremendously popular Christian talk show that chooses a scripture from the Bible and beats around it, vainly attempting to discover the scarcest amount of truth possible. My co-host on today's program is the distinguished professor of theology from Slumber in the Valley Seminary, Dr. Whittemore. <laughs> Dr. Whittemore, I'm very flattered to have you with us on the show. Oh, Flyol, I'm just fluttered to be here. Our scripture up for discussion today, Doctor, is from Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 17, if you will read. Very humorous passage here, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils <laughs> are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan. <laughs> <laughs> as lightning fall from heaven. <laughs> oh, this is fun, but tell me, why are we laughing? Jesus was making a joke, Flyola, referring to devils and Satan as being literal beings. Very clever, but we all know there's no such thing as ghosts. Oh, that is enlightening and challenging, but now it's time to introduce our guest on the program today who has views to the contrary. Please welcome Dr. Tad Sane. Tad. 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 Tad, Dr. Whittemore, like just a little bit. Well, why don't we call him just a little bit? Splendid. <laughs> Shall we call you Dr. Little Bit Sane? Well, perhaps another time. Would you give us your impression of the scripture we were discussing? Jesus was referring to Satan's literal fall from power and the authority that we have as Christians in the name of Jesus over demons and the devil himself. And I can prove to you with these spirit glasses that there is such a thing as a spirit realm. Don't listen to that fundamental theology, fly ola, 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 ola. Doctor, tell me this. Who agrees with you? Do the students at the cemetery? Stupids at the seminary? Students at the seminary. Fly ola, I'm disgusted. Every time I come on on this show, you make the same as These two, it's no good. I've got to prove to you that there is such a thing as a spirit realm. I'll put these glasses on this camera. Thank you. Dr. Whittemore, Dr. Whittemore, haven't you seen in the Word of God where it says you must be born again to enter the kingdom? I've never seen it that way. But Jesus plainly stated that you must be born again. Have you not heard that? I've never heard it that way. I know, I know what a, I know what a fanatical Christian would say. I command that demon to loose Dr. Whittemore in the name of Jesus. <laughs> of course, I didn't mean it, Doctor. Don't be offended. Well, I do take authority over that demon in the name of Jesus, and I command you to loose yourself from Dr. Whittemore. Well, I wouldn't have flipped my wig over it. <laughs> Truly absurd. I don't see why they're praying over there. I don't even understand what they're saying. Oh, well, <laughs> our time is up and we'll discuss this some other time again. No, we won't. Why would we do that? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching Beat Around the Bush. Why are those glasses on the camera?
normal persons out there, see? If I went home with you and hung around with your friends, I'd stand out. They'd say, wow, there's a group of normal people and a weirdo, see? <laughs> if you went with me and hung out with my friends, they would say, wow, there is a group of weird people and a narc. <laughs> and, and questions, <laughs> questions occur to me that don't occur to normal people, like, how do you get Teflon to stick to a skillet when nothing sticks to Teflon? <laughs> Or how do you know when yogurt's gone bad? <laughs> or what would it be like to try and nail jello to a wall, you know? <laughs> well, these are things that bother me. You know? How did you become a comedian? I mean, were you just naturally funny all your life? Well, no. I was bizarre all my life. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, when I first started uh, preaching, you know, I, I used my testimony a lot. And my testimony was so gross that I started throwing a few jokes in to lighten things up, and lo and behold, everybody liked my jokes better than they did my testimony, and all of a sudden, you know, now I'm a Christian comedian. And I, I was talking with Hicks and Cohagen the other day, and, and uh, they were saying, you know, you're the grandfather of Christian comedy, the rest of us would, and, and I thought, gosh, you know, I've been around long enough to be the grand something, grandfather of something other than my own granddaughter, <laughs> you know, grandfather of an idea, as well as uh, my granddaughter will be, well, she's a year old today. Yeah, she's cute. You'd like her. She's real cute, real cute. She dresses real cute, and her mommy's real neat, and, and she's, she loves me, and I love her, and it's... <laughs> sorry, I have pictures. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Your ministry is, is uh, it's big. Yeah. It's, I mean, you've got an office back there in Kentucky. How many people? 30. 30 people. Yeah. Why we is it so big? I well, mean, we handle between forty-five and 50,000 prayer requests and counseling calls a month. We have prison ministry, we have a ministry to people in mental hospitals, and we have our anti-occult work. Uh, we're, we're very thankful that the Lord has shown us favor with so many people and that we can be on TV and that we can do concerts and that we can put out records and books. But bottom line for us has always been people who have nobody else. And uh, because it has been that way for so many years, uh, a lot of the people who wouldn't touch normal folks with a 10-foot pole know where to find us. <laughs> so, you know, we, we stay fairly busy. Well, your concerts, are, you're selling out just about everywhere you go. I'm, I'm sure everywhere you're going. Tell us a little bit what happens at one of Mike Warnke's concerts. Well, we have a good time. You know, we just party down, talk about Jesus, and, yeah. you know, just have a good time. Everybody gets to laugh. And, yeah. You know, I've said a million times that I get them laugh until they get their heads thrown back, and then when they expose their Adam's apple, yeah, you know, <laughs> let them have it, you know. Uh, uh, everybody seems to like to laugh, and it really takes down a lot of barriers. I think the one thing that we hear that is most pleasing to us is uh, my brother, he's into drugs and he won't listen to anything about the gospel, but he'll listen to you. And so that's the thing that, that, that we feel that comedy has done. Put us in a place to talk to people about Jesus who ordinarily wouldn't listen because everybody loves to laugh. Yeah, but that dog got old and all her teeth fell out and her eyes got bad. And she got arthritis in all four legs, and, and she wouldn't even chase people that come in the yard no more. She'd just lay on the front porch, and when somebody would come to the gate, she'd go, stranger. <laughs> At least I think he's a stranger. I can't tell too good, you know. Why don't you run up there and grab him and drag him down here, and if we don't know him, I'll gum him one for you, okay? <laughs> well, I mean, you can imagine being bitten by a dog with no teeth. I mean, a regular dog run up and say, wah, you know. Old dogs say, na 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 it doesn't hurt, but it sure take the crease out of your slacks, I'll tell you that. And barking doesn't help, because a dog barking with no teeth doesn't make a scary noise. <laughs> Woof. I mean, would that scare you? You're at my house and steal my personal belongings. You got one leg through the bedroom window, you hear wolf. <laughs> Does that make you want to run away? No, it makes you want to check your shoes.
Perhaps the best known case in the growing national problem of Satan worship is the tragedy of Sean Sellers. At age 16, Sean brutally murdered his parents and a convenience store clerk, all he claims as sacrifices unto Satan. He is currently on death row under maximum security, awaiting his execution date. He has been sentenced to die by lethal injection for his crimes. I visited with Sean at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. And I began doing rituals alone and with my friends and stuff. We, we, we gathered together and uh, created a coven. And we did various rituals and uh, ceremonies. And I began drinking blood, my blood, my friend's blood. And um, I think what happened was you wanted to, uh, that first initial feeling I got was so incredible, that's what I desired. Kind of like whenever a, uh, a heroin addict the first time he shoots heroin, it's so incredible, but he can never match it. He can never get that feeling again, and so he does more and more until he finally ODs. I think that's what happened with uh, Satanism. That incredible feeling that I got, I couldn't, I couldn't feel it again. I couldn't get it, get it like I felt it the first time. As I began to get deeper involved and question things, I began to just, just forget. I just began to just. Uh, decided that I was evil, and that's the way it was, and there was no hope for me, and so I delighted in being evil. I began having dreams, sick, sick dreams of, of blood and rape and violence and murder, cutting people up in little bitty pieces and stuff like that, and I reveled in these dreams. I enjoyed them because I prided myself in being evil. Um, in school, I was getting a little weird because I ate a, lot, I ate a leg off a live frog in my biology class. I was doing some weird things. I uh, drank blood at lunch one time. I was playing with a vial of blood, and it broke, and so I drank it, and shh, people freaked out. And uh, so everyone was saying, stay away from that person. Do not go near that person. He's a Satanist. He's crazy. He'll hurt you. And it was during that time, I began to have a dream that I was, I was mad at my parents because of some the problems we had with my girlfriend and stuff. And I began having a dream that I'd kill them and had that dream over and over and over again. And I did a ritual, a destruction ritual on them and stuff, you know, and wishing, wishing they were dead and wishing I was free from them. And so I began to not love them. In fact, I told my mother that I didn't love her. Just called me and told her, I don't love you. And I never realized how much that I'd hurt her until later on. But at that point, she uh, began to reach out to me she began to realize that something was wrong and she didn't know what it was, but she tried to reach out to me, but it was too late. I had already, I was already gone. I was already too far engrossed and buried into the occult and into my own little world that she couldn't reach me. Her love couldn't reach me, her prayers couldn't reach me. Nothing could reach me. And one night, I just snapped, something happened. And I just got up in the middle of the night and walked into the room and I shot them both in the head and killed them. What did you do after that? I laughed. I giggled, a hideous giggle. I just sat there and giggled as I watched the blood pour from my mother's head. Shortly thereafter, Sean was arrested and convicted on three accounts of first-degree murder. Since then, he has completely renounced Satanism and has made Jesus the Lord of his life. He now fills his time taking a Bible correspondence course and writing letters to teenagers, encouraging them to steer clear of Satan's vices and to live their life for Jesus Christ. Jesus died so that we could have life. Jesus died so that we could live. So let's live for him, and living for him is telling the world about him. Be an idealist. You can change the world for Jesus Christ if you only try. Other startling revelations concerning the worship of the devil have been uncovered in preschool and daycare centers around the country. We recently talked with the parents of a four-year-old girl. They thought they'd enrolled her in a Christian daycare only to find out it was a front for a satanic coven and the ritualistic abuse of children. She saw everything from uh, a nude man clear down to murder, clear down to satanic rituals, children being stabbed and tossed in the river with other people from the school waiting down the river so once the body floated down they could get out of the water before there was any identification. She drew, um, when she was really disclosing the, the murders, she drew four little girls on a, on a paper plate and then she drew four boys and they had um, frightened faces 
because they were going to be murdered. And two of them were twins. What would you say to the little children that were out there? Pray and, uh, and scream. Yeah. And tell mommy and daddy. Uh -huh. Don't be afraid to tell mommy and daddy. I know. Who's your savior? Jesus. As a small girl, Lauren Stratford was forced by her mother to be involved in kitty pornography. Later in her teen years, these same pornographers uh, introduced her into Satanism. She became pregnant during a ritualistic sex orgy. And they asked her to do something with her baby that she would never forget. I, I did become pregnant. And uh, I had a child. who was taken from me at birth and I secretly named him Joey. I seldom got to hold him and I have seen teenage girls who have gotten into Satanism. I've seen them give their babies to Satan, some willingly, some have had them taken and then threaten so badly that they'll never tell anybody about it. These are not babies anybody knows about. And at the age of six months, uh, they had a ritual where I was the altar, the, the human flesh altar. And uh, Joey, at the age of six months, was laid on top of me. So I was the sacrificial altar upon which he was sacrificed. The details of Joey's sacrifice are too gruesome to be repeated, although a common activity among many Satanists. As described in her book, Satan's Underground, Lauren was forced against her own will to participate in these satanic rituals, and her eventual deliverance from this abuse was nothing short of miraculous. My body was very broken. I was living in the hospital. I was near death several times. And I, I just thought I was going to die. And one, one night I was watching television. And I heard a woman, it was a Christian network, and I heard a woman saying, babies are being sacrificed. Rituals are going on where victims are made to give their lives. It's true, it's happening all over the country, and you better begin believing it. And the minute I heard that voice say that, it was like, it was like a light came on in front of me, and I thought, that's the person I gotta find. I've gotta talk to her because I know she'll believe me. Lauren eventually found that lady and was completely set free by the power of Jesus Christ. And that lady's name was Johanna Michelson, formerly a spirit channeler and involved in the incredible phenomenon of psychic healing. Unfortunately, there are few people in the world who do have the ability to so, if you will, channel the demons, the spirits, that they're able to produce things that are, to say the least, startling to most people listening to it. This woman would while in her trance state and under the possession of this spirit, be able to not only diagnose diseases, frequently in medical terms, and she only had, as far as I know, about a second grade education, she told me, but would also very frequently diagnose uh, the need of an operation and would have the patient come, stretch out on a cot there on a sheet, and with no anesthetics, the person was wide awake, no antiseptics, unless you want to consider a bottle of alcohol, sprinkled rather liberally, liberally some antiseptic. It's enough to make any surgeon shudder and, and drop dead. And a couple of them practically did when they saw what was going on there. Would literally, with a rusty honey knife and pair of scissors, cut open the person's body and put in or take out whatever was needed. I saw incredible things. And I once watched this woman cut open a woman's lung underneath here and red rag and all insert another piece of lung tissue into this woman's cavity and then seal it up. Could it have been sleight of hand? The woman wore short sleeves, a tunic, there were no pockets. I, for the most part, when I was handling the operations, was setting them up. 
And people can believe me or not, but I wasn't grinding betel nut juice. We weren't setting up little vials of blood. I was frequently with the woman all day long before an operation. We'd walk in, I would be the one to cut the cotton, to set up the instruments, to whatever it is that we were doing there. And I wasn't buying chicken gizzards across the street from the market. If it was sleight of hand, it was the most incredible sleight of hand I've ever seen because I had my hands in the wound. I felt the blood pulse over it. And God literally one night pulled back the veil and let me see the source behind Pachita, demonic beings that literally almost cost me my life. And that frightened me so badly when I tried calling on my spirit guides and the spirits around me just mocked me and laughed at me even louder that I realized that I'd been following not only the wrong Jesus, but uh, was wrong about reincarnation and a lot of other things as well. Johanna Michelson, Lauren Stratford, a richly abused little girl, and Sean Sellers. Different people with different stories, yet all originating from the same source, and each one almost ending in death. And for Sean, it still may. Is this something we should ignore? Behind me you can see Unit F2, Death Row, and that's where Sean Sellers will spend 23 hours out of every day for the rest of his life until his execution. And yet there are people that say Satanism isn't that serious, it's just fun and games. But let me tell you something, you'll never convince Sean of that. It's dangerous and it's got to be exposed. Oh, hello, Legion. Well, that's a terrible night, isn't it? Oh, I hope I don't get some guy who knows his authority in Christ Jesus. Ah, don't say that name. Show some respect. Yeah, things really have been uh, heating up around here. Oh, yeah, these overtime double shifts are really burning me up. Look at the dark side. Our time is very short. Permanent retirement out at the lake is right around the corner. You don't have to remind me. Oh, why did I have to be one of those idiots in the 33.33 percentile who followed that bozo down here? We had it so cushy in heaven. <laughs> Well, you know what they say. Yeah, that's all fire under the bridge. Listen, let's face the facts, buddy. Our goose is cooked, and what's done is done. We know it, he knows it, but thank our lucky stars, most of them don't know it. Yeah, yeah, the, the chance of things changing down here are about as great as, as the odds of us hosting the Winter Olympics. Hey! I think I'll check out my assignment. Oh, look, look, I've got Joey again. Great. Oh, <laughs> heavy metal Joe. Yeah, man, heavy metal Joe. Like I had him for a day last week, yeah. man. We did three hours of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, good. And we listened to some Iron Maiden, some ACDC, and we topped it off with a little bit of the crew. Oh. We had that stereo cranking, man. His mother really got ticked off. Uh, you put the spirit of rebellion in him, didn't you? Listen, eh? I wasn't thrown out of heaven, you know, yesterday, yes, eh? I've been thousands for many years now, eh? I know what procedure is, brimstone bray. Oh, yeah, what'd you have to do next? Run off a cliff into the sea? <laughs> really? Well, actually, I have matured a bit since that pig incident. <laughs> I wish you'd lay off. Look, the most important thing is to realize that you've had an integral part in the destruction of an entire family. Yeah, yeah, if you just deceived one soul it makes it all worth it hey bro you look terrible I don't recognize you from anywhere yes well I was recently transferred from the religious deceptive division uh, well, what is your name Harold Harold Krishna but my friends call me Harry 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 Krishna well you really had an impact in America for a while there what happened Oh, that Bob Larson exposed me on his radio show. That's why I was transferred. Well, that's the nastiest thing I've ever heard. Hey, you look like hell. Well, appreciate the compliment, I do. But I was on the Lust Squad last night, and I tried to tempt some Christian. And just my luck, he knew and used the power in the name of Jesus. And... Yeah! <laughs> Don't say that to no! Okay, okay, Mr. J. But I don't know how much longer I can take running into these Christians who know their authority in Mr. J. We can relate. 
we go searching to and fro for those who are afraid of us, not those others. Yes, it's the old Roaring Lion principle. You make a lot of noise, and then you scare them. And that opens the door, and you nail them. Well, it's easier said than done. When you have a kid who has his head job and knows how to use the J name, it's hard to handle rejection like that. Well, listen here, partner, and listen tight. I want you to know the best thing for you to do is just not hang around with that kind, because, fella, they'll make your life hell on earth. Attention all demons, we have an emergency. I repeat, an emergency. A revival is in progress. A major revival is now in progress. Mr. J is on the move. All strife and deception demons report directly to the throne room. Not all again! It's going to be another long outpouring! Let's go we get our heads bashed again! A major revival is in progress. Now, Mom, she uses questions to raise us all our lives. Isn't that right? Mom says things to us like, do you want me to slap your face off? <laughs> so, oh, yes, ma'am, I've always wanted to have my face slapped off. I could keep it in a box under the bed then. <laughs> Think what a hit I'd be at show and tell. This is me, <laughs> you know. You want me to slap you into the middle of next week? Well, who will recognize me? I'll be over there with no face. Is Satan really being sold to this generation today? I think so. I think that uh, it's being sold to this generation uh, probably more than any other generation before. And uh, one of the things that we see that bothers us so much in, in our dealings with the police departments around the country is we're seeing younger and younger people getting involved at a, a much earlier age and becoming involved deeper sooner than ever before and that is really frightening you know it used to be uh, you saw people who were in college or maybe even older than that who were getting involved in in these sorts of things the the Manson family type syndrome where those people were all you know in their 20s and Charles was you know in his 30s but now we're seeing kids 13 years old acting out things that their uh, spiritual leaders if you want to call them that tell them to do and as a result you know we're dealing with a lot of cases of, of um, kids killing their parents, uh, getting involved in, in uh, all kinds of different uh, satanic uh, organizations, uh, other kinds of crimes uh, from vandalism to uh, desecration of churches, and it, it's become big, a big enough problem in this country that there is actually a national task force on occult crime that involves police departments from all over the country, which we're part of. So it's, uh, yeah, it's very, you know, uh, a very definite problem. There's a lot of young people watching the program right now, and I want you to address something here. Does a teenager that, that's watching this show right now, do they need to be afraid as, of the devil? Is there any reason for them to fear him? If, if you're involved in Satanism, there is a reason for you to be afraid, but it's, it's what you're involved in and not who you're involved with. Once you become a Christian, the Bible says clearly, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is he greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, I've lived off that scripture for 22 years now. I got saved in 1966. I have a three inch scar on my wrist where my friends used to cut my arm and bleed my blood into a cup and mix it with wine and urine and drink it for communion to Satan. I was involved as deeply as you can get. Uh, drug traffic, uh, dealing with uh, different mafia connections in Southern California, transporting drugs. And there is no reason that I should be sitting in this chair talking to you this afternoon alive, except for the fact that he that was in me was greater than he that was in the world. And I had to learn to rely on that. It wasn't something that came to me in a flash, but something that came to me because I decided that I was going to believe in Jesus and walk with the Lord regardless of what, even if it cost me my life. And as a result, as my strength grew and my faith grew, then, you know, the fears that I had were, were taken away. And now I'm not afraid of Satan anymore. I'm just angry with him. And I'm angry with him on account of the kids that are listening to this program. And if I'm speaking to you directly, then I'm angry at Satan on account of you because you are being lied to, you're being tricked, you're being cheated, and there's no reason for it. When Jesus died on the cross to wash away our sins, he died for all the sins of the world, including yours, and the strength that he has through the love of his personality can set you free from anything that you're involved in. And if you have anything to fear, 
It's what you're into, not who you're into it with, understand me. And you can put down what you're into, and you can try on over those that you're involved with. So don't be afraid. Start treating like royalty around here, or else you're gonna end up goat's head soup. Listen here, Collins. You put my little brother in right now, or you're gonna learn something about sacrifices. Rocky, get off the player's field right now. Barry, sit on the bench. No, Barry, come with me. You don't need to be on this lousy team anyway. You better watch your step, Collins. Don't you think I'm going to let this one slide? The subject of tonight's meeting requires immediate attention is that of Doug Collins. I want you to come forward right now. Yes, don't worry about it. The buses will wait. Your friends will wait. Come forward as we sing this chorus together. Just as I am. Yes, come on up. Without one flea. Everybody, I love you, sweet Jesus. Doug, it's a great altar call. Great altar call. Uh, looks like all the furniture's under conviction. <laughs> yeah, the altar's just jam-packed, as you can see. Listen, would you pray for the lamp there, Dad? I think it needs some ministry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hallelujah. All right, it's got the light. Good. What are you preaching on tonight? Dad, I've really been praying about it, and, and I sense deep within me that I'm going to be preaching on the platform. <laughs> you smart like kid. What are you going to be preaching on? <laughs> Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. <laughs> Prophetic. Pathetic. Come on in. Yo, Doug, you ready to go to the Solid Rock Cafe and hear Herbie Henderson and the Holy Rollers? You bet, man. Just got to go brush my teeth. Good to see you, Clarence. Cheryl? Cheryl, how you doing tonight? You all right? Oh, just fine, Good. I guess. Clarence, listen. Why don't you take my keys and go out to my car and play with my electric windows? Really? You never let me do that before. <laughs> ready, Cheryl? Uh, yeah. Listen, Doug, I really need to talk to you before we go. Listen, I'm... <laughs> Under a real heavy anointing right now, and I gotta preach tonight. Do you think it could wait till after the meeting? Yeah, sure. Great, let's go. Good night, Mr. Collins. Good night. See you, Dad. Hey, Doug. Yeah. I just wanna let you know I'm really proud of you, son. <laughs> if you're gonna preach tonight, you better go on. <laughs> yeah. I am not dismayed Cause I'm walking in faith and victory You gotta walk in faith and victory For the Lord your God is with you Woo! Good job! Herbert Henderson and the Holy Rollers. Pretty good, huh? All right. 
Listen, you guys, as we close tonight, I just want to uh, share a scripture with you. The book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse number 20, Jesus says something very interesting. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And I believe a lot of you, as you've heard the music tonight in the ministry, have felt the knocking of Jesus at the door of your heart. And some of you need to make a decision tonight to open that door up and say, Yes, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. And so I'm going to ask as we close that everyone would just bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. And if you're here tonight and you say, Doug, that's me. I know that I need Jesus in my life. I want you to do something. I want you to raise your right hand just as high as you can. Would you do that quickly? Just slip it up right wherever you are. Okay. Thank you very much for those hands. All right. You who raise your hands, I want you to just get up out of your seat. Don't be afraid. Just get up out of your seat right now and come right down to the front here. Come on, man. Over here. Come on. God bless you. Good to have you. All right. Good job. Good job. What's your name? Lance. Lance? Jesus really loves you, Lance. Good to have you here. And that goes for all of you. Jesus loves you so much. And I want to lead you in a prayer right now to make Jesus your Lord. He's going to change your life. Okay, Lance. Now, as far as continuing your Christian walk, one of the first things you need to know is how to recognize the Antichrist. The number to look out for is 666. Don't let him put it on your forehead or your right hand. I personally wouldn't let him put it on my left hand or, or get, a, get a phone number or a license plate or anything like that with 666 on it. Now, let's talk about Daniel's 70th week. Okay, Clarence. I think that's enough foundational teaching. Thanks a lot. <laughs> hey, Lance, uh, where do you live? Yeah, you can call me Goat. Goat? Really? Like Billy Goat? Nah. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Goat, <laughs> uh, if you need anything, man, just let us know. We're really glad to see you invite Jesus into your life tonight. Well, uh, I, I could use a place to stay tonight. Well, you don't have a home? <laughs> where do you sleep? Uh, I slept in the park last night. Wow, that sounds like fun. You can sleep over at my house. I'm sure my parents wouldn't mind. We could get out the Snoopy Jello molds and just have a Well, I... Hey, he can stay with us. Well, I mean, Clarence has already offered. I don't want to intrude, you know. <laughs> hey, listen, Doug, that guy's nice, but uh, he's got me kind of confused. You make God a lot easier to swallow. If I have my choice, I'd rather stay at your house tonight. Well, I, I guess that'd be okay, just till you, you know, get on your feet. Doug, he is on his feet. He needs a place to sleep. Thanks, Clarence. Hey, listen, why don't you come over? I want to show you some things in the book of John, some good stuff. Doug, can we talk tonight? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, listen, you guys get out in the car. I'll be right there. We're just going to talk for a minute, okay? Good. Now, let's talk tithing. You got any cash? Have a seat, Cheryl. Thanks. Doug, listen, I've known this for a couple of weeks, and I've been putting it off... Maybe I shouldn't tell you. No, tell me. I'm all ears. No, maybe this isn't the right time. This is the right time. Yeah, but maybe it's not the right place. Cheryl, this is the right place. Doug, don't get mad at me. Hey, I'm not mad. Is this the face of a madman? Doug, I'm serious. Maybe it would be better if you were mad. Cheryl. I'm moving. What? I said I'm moving. My dad's been transferred to a new division. So big deal, you're moving across town. No. I'm moving to New Jersey. Get out of town. You're not moving. Yes, I am. My dad's company has built a new division just outside of Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And he's job supervisor of the entire project. Okay, well, that's great for your dad, but that doesn't mean you have to move. Doug, I am not ready to live on my own. So when are you leaving? Monday morning. This Monday morning? That's in three stinking days. How come you didn't tell me before this? Now that's the face of a madman. I'm not mad, I'm just angry. You're moving away in three days and I'm just finding out now. Does anyone else know about this? No. Doug, I just wanted to keep things as they were for as long as I could. Now. You can get mad at me and ignore me for my last three days here. Or you could be a friend and we could have the greatest three days of our life. Let's just be mad at each other and not talk. Okay. I hate you. 
I hate you too. This little head of mine, I'm gonna make it shine. Honey, what time are our children coming home tonight? What children? Hey, you guys, we had another great night at the Solid Rock. Those children. Oh, it all comes rushing back to me now. You guys, I want you to meet a friend of mine. This is Lance... Uh, Pearson. Pearson, that's right. This is my dad, Mr. John Collins. Nice to meet you, Lance. And this is my mom, Mrs. Collins. Good evening, Lance. <laughs> and guess what? Lance got gloriously saved tonight at the Solid Rock. Well, praise the Lord, son. Yeah, I was preaching up there, and uh, what, there were another 20, 30 others that got saved, don't you think? No, I think it was more like three or four. Who's counting? <laughs> you know, Lance, the Bible says that when somebody receives Jesus, all the angels in heaven are rejoicing. That's right. The devil's defeated in your life now. You really think so? Yeah. Anyways, uh, the reason I brought Lance home is the guy doesn't have a place to stay. He, he slept in a park last night. Oh, man. So uh, I kind of said maybe he could stay with us tonight. Well, come on in, Lance. Come on in. Let me check your luggage there. Would everybody like something to drink? Oh, yeah. How about iced tea? Great. Super. Go ahead, Doug. Why don't you get that for us? Y you want me to get the tea? Sure. Go ahead. Well, Lance, what brings you to town? Well, I'm just where. Kinda, where are you uh, from? Kind of all over, really. How old are you? Eighteen. Did you finish school? No. How come? Well, we moved around a lot. I was in like 23 schools before I was in the 10th grade, and I never got a good handle on learning. And oh. and I, I wanted to learn, though, but I got too far behind. Well, where are your parents now? They split up. I don't know where my dad is, and my mom doesn't have enough money to take care of me, so... Besides, I'm 18. I can take care of myself. <laughs> well, Lance, if you're in a, living in a park, you, uh, you must need some help. Well, yeah, and, and that's why I appreciate you guys so much, because, you know, you're going to let me stay here and everything. You bet, Lance. You can stay here as long as you need to. Listen, we'll help you. We've got plenty of food, clothes upstairs you can wear. We'll get you a job and you can buy a car. Well, Lance, what my wife means is that, uh, you know, you can't stay here forever, but we'd be glad to help you out for a couple of three nights. That's what I said, honey. Hey, uh, here's some tea, you guys. Lance, come on up to my room. Check out my stereo, man. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Gosh, he got saved under Doug's preaching. He's really sincere, isn't he? We'll see. We'll see. Goat. I'm on the inside. Did you go without a hitch? Yeah, they swallowed the whole thing. What a bunch of idiots. Now you know what to do tonight. It's as good as done. I'll see you tomorrow night at the church. Mowed it to be.
looks like we've got a good weather report. Wait, let me read this right here. Oh, paper. <laughs> good morning, Lance. What would you like for breakfast? Do you have any Count Chocula? No. I've got fruit and, um, fruit and, oh, what do you want, dear? Oh, nothing, honey. Okay. So, Lance. Tell me, did you go to church anywhere the whole time you were growing up? Well, I lived with my grandmother until I was 10 years old, and then uh, I got confirmed in the Baptist coven and then church when I was 12. Hey, Lance, what you doing? Come on over here, man. What is about that guy? He's lying. How would you like to go swimming with Clarence and I at his house? You mean you've got your own pool? Well, we'll be swimming in my parents' pool. It's a lot bigger than mine. Mine's small and kind of shaped like a turtle, and I don't think we could all fit in it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you got any extra trunks for him? Yeah, you bet. Great, let's go. Yeah, come on, I'll show you my one and a half jack knife backflip gainer revolution. Yeah, we'll... like this. We can't wait. You going somewhere, Doug? Oh, yeah. Uh, is it all right if we just go over to Clarence's swim maybe two hours? Yes, thanks for asking. Great, thanks. See you guys. Bye-bye. This one from the great Zolvini. Watch this, watch okay, this. Okay, do a good one. Do a good one. Okay. That's... Hey, Lance, come on in. The water's great, man. I'm not much of a swimmer. Oh, come on, jump in. Be a man. What are you, chicken? All right, great, man. It's just fun. Yeah. Hey, uh, how do you feel about what happened last night, Lance? What? What happened? Well, you know when you came up front at Solid Rock and got saved and all? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Hey, you know, Jesus gave this parable this one time, and he said the Word of God is just like a seed. And when it's sown in your heart, the devil comes immediately to try to steal it. We can't let him do that. Really? Yeah. I don't think the devil will steal anything here. Well, hey, man, Jesus loves you a lot, and so do we. Thanks. Thanks. Guess who? Okay, not this game. Do I have to? Yes, come on. Okay, it's someone who's going to be soaking wet in about two seconds. What do you mean? What do I mean? <laughs> I didn't mean it. Oh, maybe I did. <laughs> hey, I bet I can hold my breath underwater longer than you can. Well, I, I really don't think I should. Oh, come on. You're not chicken, are you? No. Well, come on. Let's go. Ready? One, two, three. <gasps> well, I'm going to get you for this. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> no, I'm really sorry. I really am. So you guys are probably pretty busy packing, huh? Well, Dad's company's taking care of most of it. Well, that's nice. Hey, listen, remember those plans we made about going to the same college and everything? Think maybe we can still do that? I don't know. We'll just have to see, Doug. It's still a ways off. Hey, dudes, this guy's really good. He's held his breath underwater for, all oh, about three minutes now. What do you mean, Clarence? In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, Lance. In Jesus' name. There he is. In the name of Jesus. There it is. Put us right. You're okay, man. In the name of Jesus. Oh, what? Jesus. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Stop that. Thank hey, you. stop you that. You stop it. You almost drowned. Are you okay? Stop saying that stuff. Just stop it. Lance, where you going?
We're here at an old abandoned house where a satanic coven group has been meeting for many months. Right now, the police are currently investigating and, and trying to find leads on this case. And I'm here with Lieutenant Orndorff. He's from the Tulsa City Police. Sir, tell me, when did you first get the lead on this and what have you found? Well, a couple of months ago, we got uh, information that something was going on here. When we came out, we found over 30 bodies of dogs and cats that had had the entrails removed and the blood had been drained, apparently in some sort of a, of a ritual. Yeah, and there's been many other evidences just around the house here of satanic involvement. I have uh, right here the, the skull of a cat or a dog that we found outside, and there's been other things as well. Now, you may not be a Satan worshiper, although there's thousands of young people across this country that are involved in it. But you may have given some place to the devil in your life, and you know you have. But I want you to know that if God can forgive and set free the likes of Lawrence Stratford, Sean Sellers, Johanna Michelson, then he can do the same for you. But I read something from Psalms, and I realized that Jesus really loved me. After all that I had done, after I had knelt on an altar of Satan, covered in blood, after I had completely dedicated my life to Satan, after I had completely destroyed people I loved and things that I, were, that I was, after I had done all these things, Jesus still loved me. That was awesome. That was incredible. And I remember I knelt down on the floor and I said, Lord, here I am again. If you'll take me back, I'll serve you. And I can't even explain it, but I felt the Lord just come into me. He, uh, he touched me and He killed me. And he brought me to life, a new creature in him. Some of you may be wondering, is there anything to worry about with this Satanism stuff? Do I need to be afraid? Well, I want to tell you a story that's found in Acts chapter 19. There were these seven sons of Sceva, and they decided they were going to go and cast the devil out of this person. And they went over there and they said, we cast you out, Satan, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And the Bible says that these demons came out and attacked them, so much so that they were wounded and they ran out of the city naked, bodily injured. Satan terrorized them because they were trying to cast the devil out without a relationship with Jesus, basing their authority on what someone else knew about Jesus Christ. If you want to have authority over the enemy, you've got to know Jesus for your own self in a personal way. That city got so scared that the Bible says they began to burn all of their curious art books. These were books that were endorsing occult and satanic activity. Over $32,000 worth of material was destroyed because this city saw the reality of Satan and they began to get afraid. And that tells me that it was widespread then and it's widespread today. In fact, in part two of this program, which you just cannot miss, we're going to be talking how widespread it really is. We're going to be talking why Satanism has become so appealing to our youth generation. Things like rock music, how it's crept into the media. In fact, did you know that the number one selling game in America today is an occultic satanic game? That's all next month, next program. You don't want to miss it. But do you need to be afraid? Well, if you know Jesus Christ, the Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse number 19, that behold, or look, or, or I want to show you something. I have given you power, authority over the enemy, over the devil. And you can tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy if you know Jesus Christ. But if you don't have relationship with Jesus, Satan can do whatever he wants with you. You've got to absolutely submit your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ to say, Jesus, take over in my life. I want to have your authority. I want to have your power. We need the power of Jesus Christ if we're going to win over the devil. The Bible says that he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now notice he's not a lion because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's like a roaring lion and he tries to scare you with his fear. But if you know Jesus, you can boldly say, Satan, you get out of my life. I receive Jesus. I live for Jesus and you have to leave. And the Bible says, if you resist him, he will flee. There's some of you right now that need to receive Jesus Christ into your life. You need to have authority and boldness in Him. And I want to pray for you to do that right now. Will you pray with me? Why don't you bow your head with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for young people that are watching this program right now, that you would give them the courage to say yes to Jesus Christ. That they would say, yes, Jesus, come into my life and give me authority that I might take on the devil and win and not let him destroy me. For I thank you, Lord, that you've come to give us life and give it to us with abundance. Satan has tried to steal and kill and destroy, but we refuse to let him do that to this generation of young people anymore. We lift up the banner of Jesus in our life and we thank you for setting the young people of this nation 
of our nation free. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't miss the exciting conclusion to Family First on our next Fire by Night. What do you have for us? So far, they don't suspect a thing. Everything is going according to plan. Tonight, it will happen. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! Lance, what are you doing in my room? I've got you right where I want you now, Collins. You're a dead man. <laughs>